on to the next slide, I wanted to highlight um, some of the health benefits of implementing our climate policy here in California. The good news is, is that when we reduce combustive activity, such as burning fossil fuels, in either in our power plants or in our cars or in our industrial activities, or in our multi-family housing units, the, our, we have, those units have boilers in the basement that provide heat and cooling, as we reduce the, the combustion from those sources, not only do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, notably carbon dioxide emissions, but fortunately we also reduce emissions of pollutants that are so-called co-pollutants. On this list you see in the first two bullets particulate matter, PM2.5 is a term of art, and that means uh, particles of matter that are, that are 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller, small enough to remain suspended in the atmosphere for long periods of time. And nitrogen oxides are a gas, and nitrogen oxides is a catchphrase for both nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, nitrogen oxides contribute to a host of urban and um, regional air quality concerns, notably the uh, formation of urban smog, acid deposition, and the acidification of our water bodies. Um, and particulate matter is the primary cause of air cancer risk. So for example, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District just estimated that particulate matter comprises 90% of the risk of contracting cancer from the pollution you breathe in from the air here in the Bay Area. So by bringing down pollution or emissions of NOx or nitrogen oxides, I should say, and particulate matter, we're going to enjoy significant health um, benefits, and you can see those listed here in the slide. Avoiding 300 premature deaths, avoid, avoiding about 9,000 incidents of asthma, avoiding lost days of work, people who feel too sick due to air pollution to go to work. The, the incidence of that will be reduced thanks to our global warming efforts. So these so-called co-benefits are a very important piece of how California will enjoy benefits from our climate policy. I wanted to highlight some more findings from the research by CARB. Um, these um, bars here show a decline in fundamental um, household costs thanks to climate policy. Now a lot of this boils down to what your forecast for future fossil fuel prices is. If you think that future fossil fuel prices are going to be very high, the benefits of reducing reliance on those fuels are larger. If you think the future fuel prices are going to be relatively low, you won't believe that these benefits are, um, are so significant. But keep in mind that this chart here, even though it's a bit uh, eye-opening to see all of these household cost factors going down, the, the, the extent to which they're going down is quite small. So it's a, the biggest decline in both um, buying food or getting health care is only point, a decline of 0.6%. So again, a very small but, in, in, uh, but very likely uh, positive uh, result in terms of household or commercial scale economics. Next slide um, lists the job generating and job um, decreasing implications of our AB32 measures. You'll note here that we see a growth in jobs, and this is relative to business as usual, and this is a count of jobs in 2020. Um, in every sector except for two, our utility and our retail trade sectors, we expect um, jobs to not grow as fast. I want to be clear here that this is not, if you look at the retail trade uh, row, we see a minus 14,000 jobs. That's 14,000 fewer jobs in 2020 than business as usual, but it's not a decline of 14,000 jobs compared to today. It just means that jobs won't grow as fast in the utility and retail trade sectors as other sectors as a result of global warming policy. I'll mention that the retail sector trade, uh, retail sector job um, implications really relate to the sale of gasoline. If we're selling less gasoline, we have less people employed in gasoline um, sales spots, and that's what you're seeing in the retail trade sector. In terms of the utility sector, what we're seeing here is less. Um, uh, growth in jobs in conventional utility employment, but there's also research that shows that renewable low carbon um, uh, uh, electricity generation produces more jobs per unit of, of power than conventional um, uh, uh, our, the conventionally in our power sector. Uh, going on to the next slide, I wanted to point out where these emissions come from from, per, from the perspective of the end user. And for those of you who are commercial interests on the line, you'll see that um, small scale commercial is 10% of greenhouse gas emissions in California, not including the transportation component. Residential is about another 10%. You see industrial is about a fifth of all emissions. Um, and uh, again, this is looking at it from kind of the demand side of it. So if we just think about our small commercial, residential, and transportation components, that's 60% of emissions here in California. So we need 
to think very seriously about how to engage these sectors in being part of the solution. Because if we don't, it's going to be very hard to achieve our goals going forward. Um, I wanted to highlight um, the categories of scoping plan measures. Uh, scoping plan has become a term of art as well. That is the plan that was approved by the California Resources Board last December, and it lays out about 70 measures that, that we will implement between now and 2020 to meet our 2020 goals. Um, I've highlighted some in red and some in green. Uh, the ones in green are the ones that I think are most relevant to commercial interests and the ones we'll spend some time talking about today. When I say most relevant, I mean that in the sense that these were most likely going to have some influence on your profits, um, and that very directly relates to your operating costs. So in terms of utility efficiency, well, really what I'm, um, and this is maybe not well organized here, this is efficiency in terms of how you as a commercial operator use energy. But it also relates to utilities and um, the extent to which they become more efficient in delivering and managing the delivery of energy. So you may have heard of the concept of smart grids and, um, and digital meters that will be put on, um, uh, that will be provided to all energy users. This helps us be smarter about how we're using our energy. And that's before we get into things like building and, and appliance efficiencies, which we'll be talking about subsequently. I wanted to mention that vehicles, um, we saw in our prior slide that they're a big chunk of our greenhouse gas emissions, but they're also an opportunity in terms of vehicle mileage um, efficiencies. Um, we have um, just a, 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 a less than a month ago, the EPA finally approved California's request to implement our clean car standards, which establishes a performance requirement for vehicles in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. There are many ways to meet that standard um, and includes making our air conditioning um, more efficient on our cars, reducing some of the other types of greenhouse gas pollutants that are coming out of the effluent, notably um, methane and um, nitrogen dioxide. Um, at the same time, if we improve the, the efficiency by which our cars use fuel, that will help to meet the performance standards. And it will also improve um, the economics from the perspective of the driver. That is, you'll be spending less money on gasoline. I've done some analysis to look at the trade-off between the um, onboard equipment required to meet that performance standard and the long-term fuel savings associated with increased efficiencies. And the upshot is that it will save drivers somewhere between $500 and $1,500 out in 2020, depending on how much you drive. Moving forward, I wanted to get into um, a, um, a tool that us economists spend a lot of time staring at. These are so-called marginal abatement cost curves. Here are the um, the first one, um, and I've noted, I'm going to set, uh, show you several of these curves. The first one, CA abatement cost curve, is a California abatement cost curve developed by James Sweeney and a team of researchers in Stanford out of the Precourt Center. This slide was presented to CARB last summer, and I really like it because it um, both kind of lays out what the um, reduction opportunities are for California, um, and it also highlights which are more or less certain. So let me take a moment to, to um, help you understand what you're looking at here. The vertical axis, that is the up and down axis on the left-hand side, shows U.S. dollars per ton of CO2 equivalent reductions. Um, going horizontally from left to right, what you see is the total amount of reductions achieved. So, um, and you'll see that many of the items listed on the left-hand side actually show negative U.S. cost per ton. What that says is you will save more money than you spend to implement these measures. And these are largely efficiency measures. So you see here on the list, Municipal Utility Energy Efficiency, that's what EE stands for, or IOU, Residential Energy Efficiency, that's independently owned um, utility, residential energy efficiency. These measures, although they cost some capital money up front, will ultimately save more than they cost. The payback period, that is how long does it take for you to recoup your capital investment, is somewhere between six months and five to ten years. Generally speaking, you could expect lighting and other um, um, very um, well-developed and proven energy efficiency technologies to pay off very quickly. Um, and these investments are the investments we like to see inspired through climate policy, and we're also seeking those kinds of investments through other policies as well. This is not a new concept. We've been seeking these kinds of energy efficiency investment investments for a good 20 years now in California, and we could spend some time talking about what needs to happen to, to make these investments implemented at a larger scale. 